We are going to be getting started here with the final session in the assessment methods. And first off, we're going to have Chase Christofferson. Uh, Chase is a PhD student in soil science department at NDSU. His primary research interests are in long-term recovery of reclamation projects in rangeland ecosystems. He is particularly interested in determining ways to increase reclamation recovery success in soil environments and native vegetation communities based on site-specific planning. Additional work and research interests lie in the in inclusion of traditional ecological knowledge in reclamation methodology and land planning initiatives. Chase received his master's from NDSU in natural resource management in 2022. During this time, he serves, served as the intern on the Intertribal Forest Management Assessment Team as part of a nationwide project aimed at assessing current conditions of forests and forest management on tribal lands. Following the completion of his master's degree, he worked for a nonprofit as their natural resources and agricultural specialist, focused on efforts on tribal land management, planning, and data sovereignty. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chase, and we're going to uh, learn more about traditional ecological knowledge assessments. Right on. Uh, before we get going here, uh, just a little business for school um, and some research stuff. Aaron is going to pass around a QR code. It links to a survey I'm doing that's looking at trying to understand how people in West North Dakota interact with the land around them and sort of uh, how that has changed um, in response to oil and gas activity out this way uh, with the intention of figuring out how to maybe incorporate some some local knowledges um, in reclamation planning and site selection. Um, now that that's out of the way, uh, yeah. So like Aaron said, I'm Chase Christopherson. I'm a PhD student and graduate research assistant at North Dakota State University. Uh, and today I'll be talking about, as you can see, a conceptual look at traditional ecological knowledge and its application to reclamation planning. Um, this is going to be a very much so a 10,000, 30,000, 100,000 foot view of what traditional ecological knowledge is. Um, we're not going to get into the, the nitty gritty weeds of it. Um, so let's get started. So terminology, I think, is an important place to start. Um, I don't know uh, if maybe just by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with TEK have heard the term. Um, okay, thank, thank you. So it it's gaining a lot of, I don't want to say momentum, but it's building popularity in, in kind of the, the land management, reclamation, restoration field. Um, but a lot of people don't fully know what that all encompasses. They just hear sort of, it's, it's sort of become a buzzword, a buzz phrase. You know, it looks good in a plan. It looks good in a project. But what what does this mean? Um, so terminology, first and foremost, is important. Here are some examples that you see um, people say pretty interchangeably. Um, so we got, you know, the standard traditional ecological knowledge, uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, um, indigenous knowledge, place-based, local knowledge. Um, TK, the top one there with the little asterisk by it, that's pretty much in the vernacular. That's in the zeitgeist, if you want to say. That's what everyone knows. It's the accepted term um, in academia and any kind of report you're doing. So if you say that, everyone is going to know what you're talking about, generally speaking. Um, and so it doesn't matter. Yes and no, without getting too far into terminology and breaking down the definition of words, it does matter. Um, the bottom two here, um, I would not say are good uh, substitutions or placeholders for TK, indigenous, traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge, any of those, um, just given the differences in definition of the words and sort of what TK encompasses. So here is just some, I'll let you read them. I'm not going to go in depth on them. Um, just different definitions for what TEK is. Um, you'll see the top one here. This is the White House's stance on what TEK is. They call it indigenous traditional knowledge so that no one gets confused about what they're talking about. Um, and this, based off this year, you can see just this happened in the last two years um, around the time that Deb Holland took over uh, the position of Secretary of Interior. So this is really sort of gaining a momentum in the federal agencies a lot, um, especially. Uh, 
So there's that. And then this is this one right here is the one that I want to draw probably your attention to. If you're going to take anything away from this slide, it's this one. Um, it's the most cited. It's the most referenced in any sort of academic textbook or text or journal that's looking at this field. It's going to be this Burke's definition of TK. Um, and so basically what it's saying at the very gist of all this is that it's a cumulative body of knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation, not solely on ecology, but on sort of where people fit in their environment and sort of the role they play amongst everything else. It's more relational. It's talking about stewardship and not so much management. Um, again, I'm not going to get in too deep into it, um, but there's there's a difference between those two terms in terms of land management in this context. Um, so move on from that. What is it? So what are some examples of what TK could be? Um, it's not going to simply be, you know, over that way we, you know, this plant grows. We would gather this plant, done it for hundreds of years. It That's an example of it, but it's not simply that. Um, it can come from stories um, and traditions that have been passed down through the generations. Um, stories, a lot of times, they're they're filled with metaphor. They're filled with you know, sort of things that on the surface seem very much so um, difficult to believe. Um, however, there's going to be some sort of sort of cultural context, historical context um, that's passed down that's meant to be a metaphor for, I guess, a lesson. You could call it a moral of the story, bless you. Um, and so that's that's sort of an example of TK where you're trying to say this is what happened. This is how we got through it. Um, but it's going to be, you know, cloaked in metaphor and um, simile and things like that. Um, I have tribal members out there just because TK is thought of being sort of, you know, you, you go talk to the wise elders, you talk to the elders, they're going to know what's best. And that's, of course, they are going to have more knowledge than, than most community members. But the youth are also going to have knowledge that they've gotten because it's an intergenerational passing of knowledge over the years. And so little kids can tell you stories that they might hear from their grandparents, you know, all on up. And it's just sort of incorporated in a lot of the life um, for these indigenous communities in just whether they are aware that that's exactly what they have or not. Um, cultural and traditional sites. So that's going to be, you know, hit historic uh, village sites. Um, there is more some observational knowledge out there that I've heard from around the country that um, the prevalence of medicinal, cultural, traditional um, plants and vegetation are going to be found in higher um, percentages and in larger numbers around historic village sites. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but again, um, it would be something to look into further because um, I've heard it echoed around the country. Um, but so that's also ceremony sites. It's uh, gathering sites. It's you know, fishing sites. It's it's all these things that sort of go into, you know, these these places that hold meaning over the generations. It's not just a one off. It's understanding sort of where we as people fit into the environment and sort of the role we play um, as a, and not just our imposition of our will on it, but more so how we interact with everything in the environment. Um, and then traditional location names. I was having a pretty tough time finding examples in North Dakota, South Dakota, um, that aren't just translated English names into say Lakota. Um, so I went with some stuff from, from Minnesota. Um, I didn't get into this in my background. Uh, I took several years of Dakota at the university of Minnesota during my undergrad, um, where we sort of learned about these traditional names and sort of what they, the, the context they hold for the culture. Um, so Minnesota, just the state in itself, uh, in Dakota, and what they referred to it as was Minnesota Makoche. And what that means is the land where the water reflects the sky. So if you think about that in terms of the landscape, Minnesota has a lot of lakes. A lot of them are cloudy. They're not the clearest in the world. So they're going to reflect the clouds. They're going to reflect the sky. They're, you're going to see these things. So another example, Minneapolis, that area in Dakota is called Bereota, which means many or a lot of lakes. So Bere lakes, Ota, many, a lot. Um, and there's a lot of lakes there. 
uh, St. Paul, Imanesia, Ska, Imanesia, Cliffs, Ska, White. Um, if you've been crossing from Minneapolis, or I guess Bloomington, into St. Paul over the Minnesota River Valley, you'll notice the cliffs kind of by the river there, and they're they're sort of a whitish tan. And so that's what they're referring to. So these, there's other names, there's other locations. Um, you start to notice it more kind of once you have it pointed out to yourself. That, oh, there was probably some sort of historical context here. And what these do is they sort of describe um, ecological features um, historically that you would you would find in that location. Um, so they're, they're descriptive tellers that can be used as, um, you know, maybe historical reference for a reference site for when you're doing reclamation or restoration work. Um, and then ecological signs in the landscape. So it could be, you know, knowing where certain things grow. You could, it could be understanding that this area over there, for some reason, every so often it, it sinks a little bit. Um, you know, it gets, it's floods, not every year, but every five years or after a rain this early, it's going to flood. So just things like that in the landscape that maybe wouldn't be extremely obvious, um, on the surface level that after having that, that information passed down is going to be fairly pertinent and pre prevalent in your planning. Uh, so TK and reclamation, I sort of touched on it a little bit on the last slide. So I think a big area that we can bring it in is site-specific planning and reclamation. So sort of using that knowledge of people who have been in the area for a long time, they've got all this knowledge passed down, they know the landscape, they know, you know, the, the highs and lows, the climate variability over hundreds of years, not simply, you know, decades, but, you know, they, they understand that there are going to be hotter years, hotter periods, there's going to be colder periods and sort of how to navigate the environment over those changes. Um, as well as just sort of knowing what grows there, what works, what's not going to work, um, external interactions with sites. So, you know, it's not just where you're going to put the pipeline. It's not just where you're going to put the well pad, but also how is that disturbance just in the activity level alone offsite going to impact some of these areas that might seem like they're sort of, you know, they're offsite, they're they should be okay, but you know maybe dust is going to settle on a on some vegetation that's not going to work, or it's going to drive out the migration of some sort of animal that is pretty prevalent to the ecosystem there because they just don't like the activity. Things like that um, for site selection. Um, I guess that kind of goes into the the site determination. Um, cultural sites and traditional sites are probably something I'd like to highlight there, just um, because they're not always going to be extremely obvious on the landscape. A cultural site could be just a place where um, people have gone to harvest maybe bitter root for generations. That's that's their harvesting spot. That's where they go. That's a cultural site. That's a traditional food. That's part of their food sovereignty and sustainability as a people. So things like that are important to consider and to kind of have some input on that. Um, as well as migratory corridors. Um, so just how birds kind of fly through as well as, you know, just animals and mammals that might be on the ground in general, they, they might avoid areas that they historically were, were found in abundance that people hunted, um, you know, for a long time, they're just not seeing them anymore. They're getting pushed out by, by noise activity, um, lack of vegetation and food, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. And then species preference. So, um, when considering the reclamation work, you're going to do the seeding type. You're going to do the vegetation, kind of what you're what you're planning on doing after the disturbance. Um, there, there could be you know seed like species that you'd want to have in a seed mix that maybe is struggling in the area due to invasive species, or um, you know they're they're being outcompeted by um, the seed mixes that are being applied right now. Um, that maybe we would like to see brought back into more prevalence, just things like this that, again, I don't want to get too far into it and dive too deep, but just sort of on a base level, these are some areas that we could incorporate it. Um, why is this being talked about here? Why is this important? Why does it matter? Um, why did you come listen to me? Um, I'll be asking that for days, but this is an excerpt from the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. Um, it's really the first treaty that was signed by tribes 
in this kind of upper upper Great Plains region. Um, and it outlined, if you go through the whole document, it outlines all the tribal territory for all the tribes that were here. So you got the Lakota, you got the Crow, you got the, the Cheyenne, all these tribes that outlines based off of geographical features where their territories are that the United States acknowledges. So this one right here pertains to, you know, the Mandan, the, I think it says Groban, um, but that's the Hadatsa and the Arikara. So it kind of is the basis for what has become the Fort Berthold Reservation. Um, so this probably, most of it probably doesn't mean a whole lot. I'm sure you're not all, you know, topographic, geographic maps in your head able to just tell me exactly where this region is. So I helped you out. This is the map. Um, this is what it's describing. This area in the dark here. So if you're looking to get some sort of historical context and reference for these sites and sort of, you know, gain some information on the ebbs and flows of the ecosystem out here, these tribes in these areas have, you know, not just from their point of view, long-standing histories, but also from the point of view of the United States as well, and acknowledging that this is their the territory that they they're from. They have been on this land. They know what they're of what they speak in this area. So why it matters, it's just it's good information to have, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, so why continue? Like I said, long-standing history of interaction knowledge of the land resiliency. I think we touched on that already. Um, if you want to get super technical, tribes are always considered um, stakeholders. So anytime you do a restoration reclamation plan, a anything that affects the ecosystem in general, they are going to be stakeholders that need to be contacted, consulted with before you do anything. Um, you read an ecological textbook. This is the first one of the first things they say. And then also, why not? What does it hurt? What does getting you know working with tribes maybe acquiring some of this traditional knowledge that they've passed on that they might know about the area that might not be super obvious from just a site assessment what what does it hurt a six minute phone call six minute conversation can save you six months on the back end so you know why not uh that's kind of all i got i'm i'm open to questions um if we have time i don't know what we're sitting at we got 10 minutes do you guys want me to riff a little bit more just kidding. Um, do we have any questions? Questions. So, uh, for the reclamation plan, there's in the room. Uh, what is a good first step? I mean, um, as far as building that collaborative relationships with the folks that have the the knowledge, uh, it might be a stretch for each one of them to be able to acquire this themselves. And so, uh, just mm -hmm. opportunities in your mind for building those bridges to to help bring some of these things into the planning process. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, it's something that I spent a decent amount thinking about time amount of time thinking about. And th this isn't something that can just be incorporated and changed and brought into the process overnight. This is gonna be, you know, it, it this is gonna be a work in progress. There's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be successes that maybe happen accidentally, just by the grace of God it worked out. But um, you just, I think starting the dialogue and knowing, trying to just figure out who to reach out to at, if you're looking for tribes. So, um, you know, MHA nation, they have a, um, tribal historical preservation officer department. They'd be a good place to start. They have a cultural resource department. That'd be a good place to start. They have a natural resource department. The, these are all just, just people who are familiar with the land that are at least a good go between to maybe either they're going to know, or they're going to know people that know. And quite frankly, you're you're never going to get the information up front. Um, there is too much history um, to overcome for them to always be for tribes to just be always extremely open with their information to strangers. Um, and so that's something that is just going to sort of if you're, if you're looking to incorporate this, it will have to be worked through over years. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next week. Most likely it won't be next year, but slowly but surely that trust will be built. Um, I think the most difficult part is going to be the is, is going to be capacity on both sides, um, which I'm not a, an economist or anything like that. So I couldn't tell you how that that works out, but I'm just talking hypothetically.